Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, we have Michael Meeks with us, and he'll be sharing his thoughts on working with ancient code bases like LibreOffice. Over to Michael. I would like the lapel mic if I can have it. Cool. So let me uh, let me do the, the slide. Ooh. <laughs> and, and you know you can't make these things up, can you? Password required. I think this is VLC behind the scenes doing something awesome. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about, so I won't tell you what that says. I'll just uh, do it. So, <clears throat> restructuring a giant code base. So we have a, a unique and exciting problem in LibreOffice, uh, which is. We have a 30-year-old code base, and it's gigantic. It's 8 million lines, or, well, you know, depending how you count them. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's quite big. Um, and th the great thing is that it's got the strata of lots of different uh, problems inside it. Oh, hello, hello. Oh, this, this is now uh, intimate. Oh, very intimate. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll pop that in here. That's great. Um, <laughs> So, um, and there's lots of uh, lots of different uh, lots of different things going on in there. Um, so, so a LibreOffice, you may not know, grew out of uh, the object-oriented mania of 30 years ago. People discovered object orientation, and they were overwhelmed with their ingenuity and cleverness. And they were convinced that this was going to solve all programming problems. It was the silver bullet. And um, and so Marco Bourdieu has created a, an object-oriented graphical toolkit as a young teen in his parents' garage. So uh, you, ne you need your parents to have a garage. They're increasingly less popular these days, but it's a vital part of innovation. That, that and the water cooler. So um, buy one on Amazon. You know. Anyway, so um, he created an object-oriented toolkit, and it was reasonably successful. He grew a company, but communicating with the customers was a problem. Like, they didn't grasp how silver bullet -y um, object-oriented toolkits were. And so they created some demo applications to show off the raw power of, uh, of the approach. And the customers were much more interested in the demo applications than the, the toolkit, as I, as I understand it. And so, unfortunately, many of the original design decisions were laid down um, on the basis that this was a throwaway application that I'm just going to write for, you know. Uh, so, so whereas if you go and listen to the Microsoft Distinguished Engineer and he talks about the brilliant people that wrote Microsoft Office and says, you know, the piece table design is still what we're using today, 30 years later. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, to some degree, we're cursing the bad design decisions and, and getting rid of them. So, so there's a lot of restructuring that's been needed, quite a lot of it going on. Um, so, so when you try and restructure a big code base, the first real choice you need is, you know, so what language should we use, you know? Um, and particularly a pertinent today. And then, you know, what platform should we target? And uh, the quote at the bottom is Larry Ellison, who is... Uh, if you haven't heard his what the hell is cloud computing rant, you really should. It's extremely instructional um, and, uh, and, and very funny and probably obsolete. Uh, but, but anyway, so uh, my, my, my tip one, I have relatively few patronizing tips, um, but uh, there is actually, I think, still no silver bullet. Um, so if you meet a silver bullet salesperson, uh, you know, you might want to see, you know, try filing the thing a bit and seeing if it's silver all the way down, you know, for a start. <clears throat> Here are some silver bullets I've seen. Um, Object-oriented programming, of course, a seminal uh, you know, moment. A Java lets you develop 10 times faster. A garbage collection is absolutely amazing, and it's going to solve all known life cycle problems. Um, C Sharp, interestingly, also helps you develop 10 times faster. So I, don't, I don't know if it's that 10 times faster than Java. Maybe it's only twice as fast. Um, but there's some good things there. You know, the syntactic sugar of C Sharp is, is infecting other people. They start to think that Programming shouldn't be a long and laborious process where you type unnecessarily large statements and you feel good because you can parse them mentally. Um, maybe we could have simple stuff that we can understand. Um, Vala, of course, is, as everyone knows, uh, a modern language with, yes, all the features you'd expect. Um, a, a, a wonderful preprocessor based, uh, well, I don't know. I can't take the mickey out of Vala. But w w what I would say is that there were people Back in the day, I worked on GNOME, and I used Evolution. I was part of the team, privileged to be part of the team for a while. And um, Vala was created, and a whole load of people arrived and decided they were going to rewrite Evolution in Vala. Uh, the only difference being the language. Uh, you know, like, so uh, still GNOME, still GTK, still whatever. But what we need to do is rewrite the work of a team of 50 people for years um, in this new language. <clears throat> 
So I don't know, it didn't work as far as I'm aware. There's, there's probably some software still there, but um, anyway, it goes on and on, this kind of craziness. And as such, um, I think probably my personal favorite is another great um, Larry Ellison quote, which is, uh, yeah, quickly build their version of a spreadsheet uh, word processing app using JavaFX. Uh, so according to the register, anyway. Um, <clears throat> now, Larry made a fatal mistake, or, or someone in Java uh, did, made, a, made a big mistake here, which was to use a, a name that can actually be Googled and you can actually see the trend on. Now, most people, when they create a new language, I mean, apart from Haskell, of course, you know, um, you, you, you use a name that, you know, you can hide very easily. Uh, Ruby, you know, like Rust. Go being a particularly awesome example of this, this thing. I mean, like, you know, like, yeah, the gay trend is just completely flat over all time. Z Squat is just the terrible name. Like, don't use this name. And the reason is that, you know, I, I've seen the Gartner hype cycle. Who, who's seen the Gartner hype cycle? I mean, it's been fed to me my whole life, and I've never believed it, right? I thought, these guys are complete idiots. They're, they're management consultants trying to sell something to me. Like, why would I, why would I buy that? Anyway, um, Google Trend for JavaFX, and you see, you know, uh, there's this peak of whatever, maybe, maybe there's two peaks, you know, marketing, really getting their act together. And um, this is the recommendation to use JavaFX, you know, just before the trough of total gloom and the, you know, the utter, you know, the, the suffering of this, and then the... Oh dear, how did we end up with this technology? What are we going to do about it? How can we possibly make it actually work? And so on. You know. But it's, it's, it's nice to see that there is actually some slight factual basis behind some of the things that we're told. Um, a quote I particularly like is, uh, and you can, you can watch the talk, uh, this is from Iger Zeich, who's a distinguished engineer at Microsoft. And I'm no language bigot. I mean, I, I, you know, choose whatever you like, but just don't switch it every few weeks. Um, yeah, 30 years of, of C to C++ to, uh, you know, actually a language that can be innovated. And, you know, since I wrestled with the giants, an awful code base, increasingly good code base, um, you know, I'd like to try and persuade you that actually existing languages are things that can be evolved and improved. Yes, it's really painful. Yes, you have to go to standards bodies. Um, but actually writing entirely new languages uh, is, uh, yeah, quite painful. Although there's, there's lots of talks at conferences about them. Um, so yes, I, I think these are the, the, the typical risks that happen. So I'm, I'm not a language bigot, choose what you like, but um, yeah. It's, I, the other particularly sad thing as you, as you come to refactor your code is that it's a huge driver of duplication, language choice. I see perfectly well-meaning people who, who I love dearly who, who think that it's important to rewrite something totally in this new, uh, new thing. And I've seen this again and again with Java, with C Sharp, with... I won't go any further, but anyway, um, so, so, you know, and, and, and if you look at web technologies, there are a whole plethora of duplicate web technologies uh, that to me appear indistinguishable, and the only real difference between them is that one is in PHP, one is in Ruby, one is in, you know, rah, whatever the, I don't know, there's, there's a great stable of these, right? And you think, guys, why can't we, anyway, this is because I'm ignorant. Um, the problem is, of course, that LibreOffice over a long time has, has adopted a number of these and cargo culted. Uh, languages. I think one of my favorites is the JavaScript scripting framework written in Java um, called Rhino that we have, which, you know, well, as you know, the Java is uh, 10 times more productive than anything else. So it's very easy to write a JavaScript interpreter in it, and then um, it sits around in the code. We're slowly trying to write out Java, and not because we dislike Java. It's a perfectly good language, but um, you can't guarantee that it's actually everywhere, um, which is the slight irony of the right ones run everywhere uh, message that actually it's right ones and then try and install this thing of a certain version on all your Windows uh, hardware forever. Um, so yeah, so uh, there's some good work actually funded by TDF and our, our um, donors to, to get rid of HSQL DB, which is the last sort of blocking thing for, um, for that. So, 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 so some language choices you need to make. And there's some API choices you need to make too. Um, <clears throat> so we're particularly blessed in LibreOffice by being a cross-platform app that runs on any platform uh, you might like to think about, including, I was thrilled to see Haiku the other day. So you know the BIOS client? Uh, luckily I know nothing about that, but th these are some of the major um, APIs here. So the Windows rendering APIs that we actually use to actually render LibreOffice on nearly 200 million machines um, is actually the GDI API, uh, which was, came out with Windows 1, and it's, it was initially a 16-bit API, and it seems to make the transition to 32-bit and now 64-bit quite cleanly, uh, which, is, which is slightly baffling, isn't it? Um, it has features like not having any alpha transparency unless you have separate alpha buffers that have been you know, tacked on later into the API and this sort of thing. Um, <coughs> we also use direct write from 2007, which finally provided you a way to actually choose which fonts, which glyphs you're actually getting. 
because GDI does like a, a font config, font substitution, substitution underneath you in a completely unpredictable way. You have no idea what, what happens. And there's loads of code in, if you look in your Chromium browser, they try and work out what it is by rendering to a meta file and then parsing manually the meta file to try and work out which font was used to which glyph by the... It's, there's some exciting stuff there. Um, so direct write finally does it sort of right, but doesn't work very well um, still um, in lots of places, um, 10 years on from its creation. Um, so, so one of the things I like to point out is that, you know, as, as you restructure, it's easy to choose the latest, greatest API, um, but will it really be there tomorrow? It's very difficult to know, isn't it? Of course, in the same time, the Linux, the Linux world has, um, has managed to go through quite a number of toolkits, um, which, several of which we support concurrently. So uh, people also like to uh, tell me off for wrapping stuff, you know, like, why do you wrap platform APIs? <clears throat> why would anyone do that dumb thing? You know, we have a perfectly good API. Like, why do you put this wrapper around it? That must be evil. Um, I hope it becomes relatively obvious why. Uh, not only the cross-platform aspect, but also the fact that it keeps changing. So I think we, we're getting to QT5 from 2012. I think there's still some work going on to make that work. Is that right, Torsten? Somewhere? Oh, yeah, actually, yeah. No? Yeah. Um, so anyway, the, the platform churns far faster than you can update a multi-million line uh, application to use it, uh, which is uh, slightly, slightly distressing, despite all of the work that goes in uh, to actually improve the stuff. And then, of course, there's a whole form factor thing. You know, what, <clears throat> what should you be targeting? Uh, you know, the, there's a constant evolution of, of trendy platforms. Um, yeah, the audio assistant one is, is particularly uh, fun. I, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing that. And then, of course, the hardware people are busily at work trying to overcome, you know, the fundamental problems of physics and, and scaling things by, by making processes much wider and frustratingly insecure. <clears throat> uh, that by improving their IPC, obviously, speculatively. Um, we also have a wonderful thing recent, in recent times, which, which actually gives us hard numbers, uh, crash reporting uh, statistics uh, uh, Marcus has uh, produced and uh, produces lovely, lovely data. Um, <clears throat> so of the two million plus crashes that we, we analyzed, um, we're getting more threads. Like, it, it's real. We need to actually do something about threading, um, although the, the gradient is not very quick. This is a year, of, a year of data. But you can see that the one CPU people who are presumably, uh, you know, I don't know what these, I don't know, I don't know where you find a one core CPU. Um, but, but anyway, there are people that manage to do it at the, you know, 3% level. Um, and this is probably not Raspberry Pis either, because Linux distributions are, you know, uh, compile this stuff out. This is mostly Windows users. Um, but yes, anyway, there's lots of threads coming along. And the, the, the cool kids who have the 80-core machines are growing, you know, like, you know, this is the, clearly the, the future uh, coming here. Sadly, that's cores, not threads. It's quite possible that threads are the uh, double that in many cases. So let's talk about threading. So one of the things we need to do then is to try and use all this hardware that's uh, on, the, on the die but not actually being used. So we've done a whole lot of work there to try and do this. And we do this in a way that um, <clears throat> is extremely compartmentalized. So it's, it's nice. So, so there's two approaches we have to threading. One is a very uh, generic UNO-based approach with a, a com-like scripting framework uh, called UNO. And in theory, it's highly thread safe and, and stuff. But the reality is that extremely granular APIs that are useful for scripting, understandable by individuals, um, not like teams of people, um, turn out to be really, really bad for performance and, and really hard to implement, um, just because threading is really, really hard. Uh, and you really want to message pass if you can, but your API doesn't look nice if you message pass. So, yeah, yeah. So we have, you know, and, and, and so that, that kind of threading is, is there, but it was still sort of one plus epsilon threads. That was Tar Taras Kleck's, uh, you know, nice thing from Mozilla. Um, you know, we, we just, you know, we do a lot of threading, we do a lot of locking, but we don't get any parallelism. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, all, all of the downsides and none of the upsides. So, actually, it turns out to be much more, more effective to find one piece of code that's at least reasonably, you know, like you could scoop it out of the patient, like, a, a, you know, a, a, and put some, some threading around it. So, for example, image scaling, for, for various reasons. Uh, we still do CPU image scaling for high fidelity, something or others, on, on lots of places. And, it's a beautiful parallelism piece. It's completely safe, and you can, you can, you know, you can convince yourself after reading it for some hours that it's probably going to be uh, safe. Um, <laughs> and you would think that's funny, like the XML parsing thing that I'll show you in a minute. We also read very carefully, thought it was safe, and shipped for, for, for years, and then, of course, you know, you find the threading bug in it, um, which, is, which is slightly worrying. <clears throat> uh, the rendering masterizes Armin's done a fantastic job of turning all of his clever primitive decomposition so CPU software rendering stuff into something that parallelizes as well. So if you have a 3D something intersected with something else in the draw application, 
you know, it works quickly. Uh, complicated charts, I, I guess, probably benefit from that too. Um, the calc core, I'll talk about in a minute, but again, desperately trying to find something that is a, a piece you can chop out and, and wave your hands and persuade yourself is, is safe in the middle of that. Um, XML parsing I particularly like because uh, people are interested in XML parsing, uh, particularly that it's extremely slow. How can it possibly be that slow? And um, I think you have to go back and blame the authors of the spec, you know, really, I don't know. Uh, like Jason has a lot to, go, a lot to say for it. Um, but either way, uh, people come up to me and say, oh, I have this brilliant new idea for parsing XML, it's going to be so fast. We're going to memory map the file, we're going to use pointers to something or other, we're going to you know, copy it into buffers, and we're going to do very little work. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, that, that'll, get, you know, that'll be a lot quicker. So, but the problem that I have is that I have a constant time XML parser. It parses any size XML file in a constant time. Uh, and can you be that? Um, it's kind of a nasty trick, really. But you, you, you saw the CPU, the graph, right? There are all these threads sitting around there not doing anything, right? So, I mean, I, I just cheat. I just shove one of these in at the bottom. And so, effectively, we have a SACS API. The SACS API is incredibly inefficient. Um, it's, it's really not designed well. What, the, the worst thing you can do for a, for a CPU iCache and dcache and whatever is to do a very little bits of work that then create lots of other work that then comes back and does another little bit of the same sort of work. And, and, you know, so there's an unzipping bit, there's a parsing bit, there's a tokenizing bit, there's a, you know, all these things. And then it disappears off into la-la land, into the calc core filter, and it comes back again, and it's a disaster. Anyway, see, so it turns out that even if you don't have two threads, <clears throat> doing a whole load of parsing, storing the results, and then emitting all the events that you got from it is actually uh, good news. Anyway, so, so this is nice. So we get, there's, there's, the fixed cost then is, it's only really true if your consumption is slower than your parsing. Obviously, you have to balance these things. Um, but actually, we try and move some degree of work between these two threads dynamically, depending on who's, who's more and less busy, which is quite fun. Um, so, yeah, that's good. So there's some setup time as you parse your first swing buffer full of events, which is uh, the kind of constant. Um, what else? So we've been trying to throw calc, as I mentioned, and uh, there's some heroes, Tor Lilkvist and Dennis Francis, have been doing some work for me on this, and they, uh, yeah. Um, so we have this thing called SC Interpreter that calculates every single cell in your spreadsheet. You know, every, every formula is a stack-based reverse Polish, you know, it's, it's, got, it's great. Um, and so we're trying to cut this thing out. It seems like it might be something reasonably separable. And then you discover that actually the token array, which describes the formula, is being mutated as you iterate over it. Like the iteration index in the ancient code is stored as a member variable of the token array. So, you know, two threads, <laughs> yeah, not very nice. And of course, uh, macros have access via this Uno API to the whole model. They can delete the formula that you're editing while you're doing it, you know, that's, um, that's great. And then of course, some of these formulae actually mutate the dependency structures which are document-based. And if you, if you parallelize this, you again have um, major fun. And then there's a whole load of other stuff that's mutated in the document, and then caches that are built. But after a while, hopefully, you can chop enough muck out of this that you can shrink the domain enough that you can, again, persuade yourself that this might actually be safe uh, to do. Um, we put a whole load of asserts in there. So we, 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 you know, in my old age of uh, having been a type safety bigot, I'm turning into a thread safety runtime checking Python loose type person. Um, Luckily, we have some very large data sets, so uh, actually loading and calculating some of these, these documents gives some nice assertion failures we're still working on uh, are routing out here. But um, yeah, so it, 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 it's some quite fun, and it actually gives you some re reasonable good results too. Um, if you're on a nice 16-core machine, let me advertise AMD, who produced some very nice ones, and uh, at a reasonable cost too. Look at that. And they funded a chunk of this work. Um, so. Uh, uh, this is my lame Linux laptop, and the Windows one just happens to be a much faster machine, as you see. So that's why it's uh, only taking half the time. Um, yeah, so what can I say? It gets quicker, but not 16 times quicker. Particularly the hyper-threading is, is not nearly as good as you might hope for, well, particularly, obviously, heavy, uh, heavy floating-point um, loads. Um, yeah, so, so what I'd really like to see is some, um, some language support. So what I need is some innovative people who love thread safety and love improving languages to go and persuade the C++ Standards Committee that having some kind of really restricted subset that does a lot more checking would be good. The C++ Standards Committee are still trying to study the problem of having built-in primitives like threads and uh, mutexes and things like that, but ho hopefully we can get them you know, past this and into the fertile ground of language innovation and include all this good stuff into, uh, I don't know, if you're crazy, come and see me later. I, I can sell you some swampland as well. 
Um, good. So there's a whole lot more to do there. Um, and of course, at the same time, we're trying to clean the code up so people can get into it. Uh, so one of the great things here is the, uh, is the German common translation. Uh, these, these are the people who actually finally got the curve down. You see this? I'm very proud of this bit here. You know? Um, there are lots of people that start projects, but, but this looked really like an exponential decay to me, and I was getting pretty frustrated by here. And I said, look, and bang, you know, these people turned up. Brilliant. Jens Karl, you know, Johnny M. They, they said, right, we're going we're gonna to finally fix this. Of course, there is a single German comment left. Well, actually, there are probably some we can't detect easily, you know, just for old time's sake, you know, so you can, you can see uh, uh, some particularly fruity examples of uh, how not to do it. Um, yes, less eye strain horror. So, um, of course, the code base is very old, and, um, yeah, I don't know, this is how we used to create strings with this RTL OU string, RTL const ask re U string pram string. Um, yes. Anyway, in, in the modern world of magic templates, you know, you can not only compile very, very slowly, um, but you can make the code look nice. And actually, you know, human time is, is much more valuable than compile time, perhaps. Um, we also have pretty iterators in this world. You know, it turns out that, you know, virtuous as you feel, having typed this great long beast, uh, managed to get it compiled, and understood the error message when it doesn't compile, um, it's a heck of a lot simpler to do just that. Um, and so there's a, there's a large scale code cleanup thing here, shrinking lines and you know, making, uh, making everything good. Um, and a, a huge tool there, and I say this with some degree of sadness, because I'm a, an FSF lover and a Richard Stallman, I have a soft spot for the man, you know. Um, but the GCC is well, well on the way out, and uh, Clang is, is just doing uh, awesome stuff. So we, we have a whole load of Clang plugins doing automatic rewriting, um, effectively expanding C++ for our use case in some cases, but also generically with some really, really nice tools. You know, I mean, the unused field checker is something that everyone, everyone should use, right? It looks at your giant corpus of code and goes, eh, you realize you've got this field, that field, this thing, that, and no one's actually using them. You might want to consider, you know, actually removing them. Um, default parameters, you know, unnecessarily virtualized, devirtualization and so on. So, um, just, just trying to, to clean stuff up. And these are only the, the ones that have sort of been most used in the last, last few weeks. Um, there's whole loads of uh, changes going in there. And, and also some sort of aesthetic ones too, you know, making this function look less ugly uh, by deconfusing its logic in various ways, which is quite, which is quite cool. So I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of that. And then uh, cleaning up uh, other stuff. So <clears throat> I mentioned our, our GDI. We also have Apple, uh, you know, have a core text API for shaping. Uh, stuff. Uh, Windows, we were using Uniscribe directly. <coughs> All of these APIs, of course, are changing slowly. And we thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could use a single cross-platform free software thing that we can look in the box and it, it lays uh, text out the same everywhere. It shapes it. So, so thankfully, due to our wonderful donors and the Document Foundation's funding, um, Khaled Hosni, who's a wonderful Egyptian chap, has, uh, has basically moved us all to use Hotbars on every platform. Uh, which is brilliant, and we would love, <clears throat> I would love at least, to use free type everywhere um, as well to render pixels, because uh, then at least you're 100% sure the pixels are just identical everywhere. The slight problem with this is on Windows, in order to print, <clears throat> you need to use GDI. It, it, it may not be obvious to you, but a lot of applications are just drawing on a very big version of the screen. You know, it's all in pixels, what comes out of your PostScript printer um, I inside uh, Windows. And of course, if you want a native platform window, you know, print dialog, and you don't want to send lots of pixels to the printer, <coughs> you're kind of doomed to use GDI, or GDI Plus, or Direct2D, or, or you could generate the PDF equivalent that Microsoft forked, which is called XPS. Uh, I think there's some kind of hook where you can shove that in and still use the native platform thing. So it's, it's kind of a bit irritating when you're a WYSIWYG word processor, and it's important to you that what comes out of the printer is actually what's on the screen. Now, I know we are a very small use case in actually carrying out a paper still. And uh, the web browsers don't have this problem. They, they, what comes out of the printer bears very little relation to what's shown on the screen. So, um, but, but we actually really care that those glyphs are, are really there. And that's a bit of a, bit of a downer. And it would, be, it would be great to come up with a, a solution that, that works for Windows. Um, drawing layer primitives, so, so increasingly just moving to new uh, and cleaner rendering models that work really well. So again, Armin has uh, done some, some great work there. Um, <clears throat> Quailon has been doing another thing. So there's an eternal tension between having widgets that are native platform widgets and having code that's easy to port and works everywhere. And of course, we have both. So um, that's very important. Um, and, and there's various ways of achieving both. We have our built-in uh, UI toolkit that's now actually used again uh, for Collabor Online or LibreOffice Online. 
Um, and you can see the full glory of what widgets looked like in the 90s, you know, uh, with their hand-drawn bevels and that sort of thing. Um, yes, it's amazing. Uh, we're going almost back to that, the whole flat UI look. Actually, you know, it's not, not too different. Anyway, so, uh, but, but to make things look pretty and to make the black-on-black -black theme work that everyone wants, you know, um, uh, we, we, we sort of capture roaming widgets from different toolkits and we torture them into making, you know, the pixels we want. And it's, it's, not, very, um, it's not very great. Uh, we miss a whole load of animations and, and other stuff. And so we've tried to tease pieces out of that. The, the native menu bars and, uh, and files, I mean, file selectors is just a, a must. Uh, obviously, that's been there forever. Uh, tool tips. Um, so really, Quailon is, is a hero here. Um, we finished converting all of our dialogues to Glade uh, XML. So we have actually a file format that's reasonably editable. We have an editor for that now, which is, which is useful. Previously, <clears throat> it was all done in TWIPS, and the TWIPS were scaled. So we knew that German is a longer language, so you should increase your font size horizontally, like all of the positions of everything, by, I don't know, 50%, something like that. But, but if it's Chinese, we know it's a much shorter language, so we should shrink all the pos positions by, say, half, so that it, it looks nice. And it turns out that actually doing proper layout is better. Uh, so, 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 uh, and, 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 and you laugh, and you laugh, but, but, but I talked to the VCL object-orientated class library people, and they said, yes, we made a deliberate decision not to do automatic layout, because a human being can always lay out the dialogue better. I'm not kidding. But, but whether he can lay it out in 156 languages, you know, better, is, uh, yeah. It turns out he never has the time, so... Um, Better to do a bad job. And um, so anyway, there's, there's nearly a thousand of these UI files. And another thing people say to me is, why don't you do a, a Firefox, you know, like strip down to the bare essentials or a, a Chrome, which is perhaps even more extreme, you know, remove everything, right? And um, well, part of the reason is we have nearly a thousand dialogues uh, in, in, in the product. And there are lots of complex features in each of those. You know, there are many tabs. And just the, the, the surface that you need to actually control what your document is doing, how it lays out, is... is is staggeringly vast. I tried to grasp how many UI files there were in the whole of GNOME, you know, like all of these things on my, my disk from the rest of the desktop in total. And it, it gave me a suspiciously smaller number of this of the order of about 200. Um, but if you can repeat that on your laptop and tell me the answer later, I'd be, I'd be pleased to know. It's, it's hard to grasp the scale and bigness of, of what's there. And the good news is now, Aquilion's done some fantastic work uh, making it actually load a UI file. So, if I can uh, try and get my VLC to uh, show you, I can show you the a demo of the, uh, his, his work here, really. So um, <clears throat> this is LibreOffice, if you haven't seen it. And this is a dialog. And this dialog is actually using GTK. So it's a GTK dialog. And these widgets, you can see the surrounds there. Can you go in blue? You can see the fading out things here. You can see as you move, it's got some degree of uh, beautiful transitions. This thing on the right here is actually a VCL rendered preview thing, because that's kind of hard to... You can't pull that to GTK. It's just like tons of work. We have those. And there's lots of weird. I'll play it again because it's uh, you know, obviously too, too cool. Um, I don't know if you're appreciating the goodness of the pixels in the background and the, the intrinsic uh, value here. But, it, but it's nice to have that. And then, of course, the theming is really, really, uh, really good. It should work uh, beautifully and not like a squatting alien uh, for those corners where. I mean, I'm not prejudiced against aliens, I would point out. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an alien lover. Um, but. Yeah, here we go. So there you go. So some great work there from Quello. I'm really impressed. And of course, that, that leaves us sort of in a, a WX widget sort of uh, situation where in some cases then we're using these, uh, these, native, uh, these native things. And you can see uh, some, some things there where there's actually kind of bugs and the horrible theming stuff. The page breaks around, focus around is, is knackered. The, you know, this thing is not, not working nicely and so on. So, you know, actual improvements as well. Other things we're doing to try and clean up are, are things like the security uh, work that's going on. So OSS Fuzz is, is, is rocking my world and my mailbox as it uh, spams me uh, regularly, but, but many other people. And again, Quailon here is, uh, is just a hero for fixing endless things. Um, so <clears throat> there's a thousand core cluster, perhaps more, uh, there that Google are providing to run AFL um, under ASAN. And well, I don't know, if you, if you have a large C, C++, anything that compiles to binaries, uh, that can be executed uh, by AFL, you really, really need to be plugged into this guy. It's just uh, unbelievably good. And people come to me and talk about manual auditing uh, still. Generous, lovely, wonderful, wonderful people. And, um, and I try and persuade them that actually, in fact, manual auditing is dead. Um, we all know that robots are going to drive our cars. Um, it's inevitable. 
uh, probably into walls initially. But um, in the end, it'll all be good, and walls will get softer, and you know, uh, it'll all be it'll be fine. But but one of the the easiest tasks, you know, is 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 some of the stuff we're seeing, you know, like the Clang plugins that are starting to do a whole lot of code cleanup tasks that engineers can do automatically. That's only going to grow. But one of the perhaps most tedious tasks in the world is auditing. You know, following the consequences of this integer being slightly too large through the code and the exact side effects of that. Or following, you know, the, the, the life cycle of this or this index into some other thing and where it's dereferenced. And following all of those back through the code, back to the file or untrusted data. There are people that still do this and they, they drink coffee, I hope, lots of it. And, you know, they prop their eyelids open with, with matches and they, they, they do find things. However, the problem is that when they've gone away and heavily audited the uh, random number generation uh, you know, scheme in um, SSH and Debian, uh, the problem is that next week someone comes in and, okay, so you're, you're, there is still a role for manual auditing, as you can see, functionally. Um, but, but, you know, they, they carefully audited these, this binary code uh, checking thing, and, and the next week someone comes and commits a patch that looks perfectly innocuous, that breaks exactly this code path. Um, and the great thing is that OSS Fuzz starts to show us these things within a few days. So simply because it's there, it's got this huge corpus, and it's updating very regularly and following master, and it's got genetic algorithms and AI and backpropagation. It's just an amazing thing. It sits there and it finds the problems before they can escape, which is just fantastic. So the, the, the benefit of hooking it up and you know, consuming an entire you know, North Pole's worth of electricity somewhere else is that um, you, know, uh, you have security in the longer run. Uh, which is great. Of course, Kverity is another a great static checking tool, and Kverity scan we're very grateful to, and our score is still lower than that of the Linux kernel. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not claiming that that means that we're more secure than the Linux kernel, Samba, or uh, you know, I don't know, whatever else you happen to be running, but it's nice. You've got to you know, tease these people, haven't you? So, so we do all this rampant and rabid refactoring, or uh, re-fixing and, and cleanups and all this sort of stuff that there's no commercial justification for, you might think. Except that if you don't do them, your code will become like a relic and a not a very holy one either. Um, so, so one of the things we do to try and stop this becoming a real problem is uh, unit testing. And you'll see that the graph is, almost looks like it's going upwards. Like 6.0, there's even more unit test asserts. I, you know, so, so I'm a lover of unit tests, and we, we need more and more of these. And this is why there's a great credit list. These guys did greater than 20 commits uh, to unit tests in the last year. So there. Yeah, they're my heroes. Look at that. Um, fix each bug just once. Don't continually fix it. You know, there's, there's plenty of jobs for life in LibreOffice without needing to refix the same bug. Um, and then, of course, you know, refactors, as we all know, just cause regressions and don't, you know, don't do any good for anyone. Um, so how do the stats look? Well, we, we track our um, bugs very, very carefully. And uh, the, the QA team is awesome. Uh, Raul is here. I think Cisco is here. Is Raul here? Yeah, you know, waving over there. And, um, yeah, so, so we, we tag regressions uh, very nicely, and so we, so we look at these. And so over the last year, we've had about 33,000 commits, and our open regression count has gone up by 142, which sounds bad. I'll talk about it in a minute. But that's one effectively lingering regression for 0.4% of commits. And I think this is a reasonable, a reasonable ratio. Um, it's not for free. There's a lot of work going in there. There's something like 2,000 closed regressions in that time that we've created and killed. Um, so... Many of those didn't escape, thanks, thanks again to the QA team that tested before they hit the masses. Of course, there's always one or two embarrassments in the early series, but um, and how serious are they? Well, of course, we also try and triage the, the most irritating of these and make sure that they're, uh, you know, that they're addressed really quickly um, and they don't escape. Um, I just want to persuade you that some bug fixes rob Peter to pay Paul. So one of our problems is you know, that some of our bugs are of the form I click on the file, and then I go and make a coffee, and when I come back, it's opened. Now, there are increasingly few of these, uh, you know, and, and we're doing some great work, but often we have to do a trade-off between, well, let's make this case much quicker, but unfortunately, this minority case will get slower. Now, this is a regression minefield, you know, like uh, this minority case that you think has one extremely vocal user who files a regression saying, you got, you know, like everything got 100 times faster for 90% of people, but my 2% use case got half as quick. What are you doing? You know, like, you idiot. Um, and so you get these regression bugs. And, the, 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 you know, of course you could revert the patch, but the problem is you shipped it now. So now you get 98% of the people going, oh, what? It got 900 times slower. So what are you doing? You know, and um, so to some degree there's an eternal nature to regressions. And, uh, you know, I, uh, that's my excuse for it going up slightly anyway. I, I, I think there are other, there are other uh, causes of that too, and we should probably fix more regressions. But at least in theory it sounds plausible. 
Um, what else? Okay, so online uh, provides a, a, an entirely different platform. So the difference between having your software on uh, client side rendering to a single uh, desktop um, versus server side is, is quite noticeable in terms of how we structure our code and, and what we optimize for. And if you haven't seen it, LibreOffice Online, Collabor Online is it's just awesome. You should, you should go and play with it and uh, you know, tell your friends. But the optimizations are completely different. So in, um, on the PC, we're trying to avoid loading stuff off the disk because disks used to spin and they were slow. And memory is precious, so why fill it full of stuff you don't need? So there's all of this componentization splitting into smaller pieces. And, but online, we, we hate that because, well, it will become apparent. We actually DL open all of these things and we link them day one. So we're like, yeah, let's take a 150 megabyte, 200 megabyte hit, straight out. And, and, and multiple seconds. If it takes 10 seconds to start, no problem. Let's load all of the dictionaries and all of the hyphenation patterns as well as we start. Um, because having done this, we can then fork our children that have this wonderful copy on write thing. They don't need to load any dictionaries, any code. They don't need to do any linking. It's all just there. They just, just use it. So we, we, we deliberately go wasting memory in our pre-initialization uh, left and right. And we waste CPU time. And we should really waste more CPU time uh, and more memory. Though we have some good ideas of of ways to make it bigger and, uh, and so on. And if you use Java, you know, EJBs or something like Java startup time seems to have heavily focused on the server, uh, server side of this, uh, which is perhaps uh, why it's not succeeding on the desktop. Um, so having done all of this wonderful copy on write uh, sharing uh, work, the problem is that then our, we, we fork and our children, if we're not careful, go and then touch those pages, which is really bad because every touch you have to actually physically duplicate it. And uh, depressingly, often having touched it, you then put it back to where it was. So I, I wrote a little tool. Um, it could be really useful actually for things like KDE in it, if it's still in use, um, web servers, that starts to look at your memory as compared to your parents' memory and which pages the operating system is sharing and which pages are actually different, which is a, actually a different set. So there's actually quite a number of pages that were once touched and are now the same. Um, this is just a little example of its output. Um, so this is a string that says MathML 2.0. I don't know why it says that. I didn't really care. But you'll notice that there was a three at the beginning of it, and the, you know, the parent had one. So as we forked and did something, we, we incremented the reference count, and in doing so, we wasted a 4K page. Now, one 4K page I can cope with. But when there are lots of them, uh, this is not good. So actually, creating the tool helped us save you know, some significant chunks of memory. Uh, we staticize all these strings so the reference counts aren't mutated now. We have a, a different startup allocator that's, yeah, that, that handles this, um, which is kind of nice. And so it can give you all these statistics saying, you know, how many, how many of these pages are dirtied. What I really like is to integrate it with Massif or something like that so that we can say, this non-string toxic bit of memory I can't understand that looks very repetitive and weird actually was allocated by this stuff, uh, which would be kind of nice. Perhaps there is a tool for that already. Julian will tell me in a minute. Um, the other thing about memory use is that you, you find some interesting things in the code. So uh, we use Cairo to render uh, fonts on the server, and these comments are particularly encouraging when you're trying to find why there's sort of 40 meg of stuff uh, for a relatively simple document hanging around. Yeah, well, these numbers are arbitrary. We've never done any measurements. Well, we did some measurements, and um, yeah, it turns out that having, for example, a fixed number of glyphs that you cache independent of their size uh, is, is not necessarily a good thing. So um, if you work on Cairo or Pixman, maybe you'll get some patches from us uh, soon. Um, but possibly we actually need to take advantage of this and pre-render a whole load of glyphs in common fonts in common sizes, you know, Arial 12 point or the equivalent, you know, uh, so that then we, we have all of these things ready. We don't actually need to allocate any memory. It's just a, a, blitting, a blitting experience. We've been tunneling dialogues, which is particularly encouraging. And I've said a lot of things that could be interpreted as LibreOffice has problems. But actually, there's some huge strengths. Doing this online stuff, uh, Kendi and his team have been uh, actually enabling this. Pranav Kant uh, is, is the guy working on this at Collabora. Um, we've been pushing these dialogues through to the client. So it's a bit like a VNC, but it's collaborative. And you know, so, so you can then have the same uh, similar selection of text. You can have multiple people popping up copies of this dialogue. And one can change the border, one can change the color, one can change, edit the size of the text, commit it, and it all works. And that, that's, that's pretty nice. And actually, the work to make it all work, well, is ongoing and requires auditing and so on. But to a degree, it just, just works out of the box because of the existing, some existing good design decisions uh, underneath that. Um, and there's some work there to try and make modal dialogues um, not pile up a huge stack of uh, pain. Uh, 
So I, I'm told I only have like a half 30 seconds to, to uh, questions come. So, <clears throat> so I'll just bash through some of the stuff in SIG0. One of the things I'm excited about is, well, the EPUB3 is, is, is pretty nice. Um, mail merge was always a bad idea from spreadsheets. You should probably use a database for your contacts. It's an even worse idea for m tables in writer. Uh, but we unfortunately have a customer that stores their address book as a, as a word processor table and then wants to mail merge from it. Bless them. And they can now. Um, and then do bless them. We need more customers. Uh, so open, open PGP is, uh, again, really cool. Uh, uh, signing and encrypting documents there. So, uh, you know, some fun stuff. Better filters. Uh, better round tripping. The EMS stuff is really nice. Uh, they're from, uh, I think, uh, volunteer. Uh, improving previews. Better ergonomics. Improved uh, notebook bar. We dropped support for Windows XP and Vista. Ha, ha, ha. Hooray. At last. You know, I mentioned the, uh, yeah, the, these APIs have a long tail. Um, and we have angry people, particularly in Russia, who, who complain about Windows XP, um, which is strange. Um, and of course, loads of stuff in online as well. There's just a whole slew of features there. The Android version is coming on nicely. So uh, pictures from cameras being inserted, presentation modes. Uh, there's some exciting stuff from Jan Iverson and um, Jan Nurmut on iOS, which is coming. And probably uh, we'll see, see that later. But, but what you should do is you should think, this is an awesome project. I could get involved. I could do something. I could make a difference here. Yeah, you know, we've got uh, dozens of other big projects in the world that are duplicates of other ones, but LibreOffice stands alone. It's the, it's the open source word processing project, you know, out there. And, you know, come and make it better. It's, it's awesome. Um, there's something for everyone. There's links you can click. There's, uh, there's, there's fun stuff. And, and one of the nice things about it, as compared to writing a small Python script, is that the problem domain is so large, you cannot fit it in your head. So the techniques you learn working on LibreOffice are the big, grown-up engineering techniques that you're going to need. And once you've grasped them and you're confident with them, you can work on anything. This, you can do anything. It's like a Superman training school, you know? I mean, I, I didn't learn anything, but I tell you, some of my colleagues are just amazing. And um, so I've got a, a paper on this, and uh, you, you can read it. Um, it's, it's, it's quite fun. And just getting a, a good structured approach to solving big problems in a way that you break it down and actually make progress. Um, cool. So yeah, we need smart people. Um, but, but what we really need is that we live in a world of AI and, and technology. And uh, you know, increasingly, this is automating everything we do. Documents should be uh, no different. So what we really need is an, an AI of incredible subtlety. And I hope some of you are into you know, convolutional neural networks and, and data sets and training that can, can see what you're doing and you know, uh, suggest cool new things to, um, to make it easier. So uh, yeah, that, that would be absolutely uh, brilliant if we could, uh, we could go there. So, Conclusions. Well, there you go. Uh, first platform change really sucks, and it's tough on us. You know, when I see that little hack to clean up GTK to remove the threading support uh, that we've unfortunately broadcast to 200 million users in our programming API, um, I feel sad inside. You know, <laughs> but on the other hand, I know that GTK3 will never die, at least not for the next 15 years. So, anyway. Restructuring, refactoring, it's, it's fun and it's risky. It is risky to some degree. And it, today it may seem hard to justify, but tomorrow y you wish you'd done it. Stopping doing it is, is also extremely risky. And we seem to be surviving the volume of change, improving and, uh, and growing, which is, which is cool. Online is awesome. Free your data, share it with people, federate it, control it. Don't give it to a large evil or not evil corporation. Uh, just keep, keep control of it. And uh, yeah, people are always welcome. So uh, thanks so much for supporting LibreOffice and uh, listening to my talk. Very good. Do you have, have a few minutes for questions? Are there any questions? Uh. <laughs> Do you have any, any unit tests for user interface, like emulating user clicking, typing text, and checking if the results are, are correct? And if so, what do you use for, for such unit tests? That is a, a fantastic question. So we have uh, a chap in OpenQA I mentioned, uh, QA called Rob, who's come exactly to be trained on that. We have a hack fest later. Marcus with the red shirt over there waving a hand right now. Um, wrote the infrastructure to do that for the Document Foundation. Um, it's built into our toolkit because it really needs to be. And yeah, we, we do have some degree of those tests. Uh, you can run them in Python, I believe. And they're, they're, quite, they're quite simple to do. Great way to contribute. If you find a bug and you don't want it to come back, write a test for us. Make sense? Um, you said you had some issues with threading, as everyone does. Um, do yep. you have, uh, there's nice frameworks and libraries in C++ now to ease the development, like HPX, Boost Fibers. Did you um, look at those? Uh, do you plan to use one? 
Yeah, so do we plan to use uh, the new C++ features? So, yes, uh, definitely uh, for threading. I, I, I suppose so. So we have a threading abstraction, of course, that's old, and we're trying to move away to that to, to more standard C++. Um, there are benefits to that, and it's, it's, it's quicker um, in some ways. I think that, yeah. So, so there are a number of things to be said about contended mutexes and critical sections and standardization and Windows not working well and you know, other things, but um, why not? Come and get involved, you know, make our code look beautiful. That would be cool. Anyone else? Ah, oh, a gentleman over here. Hi. I work for a government department that's recently adopted Office 365 for all our staff. Are we locked in forever, or <laughs> is there some way where you can help us uh, move in the future? So, so, so when you say you've adopted Office 365, what does that actually mean in practice? Because if you're using the online editing functionality of Office 365, you rapidly discover it's less functional than Collabor Online, which is only two years old. And, you know, uh, it, it's not a tool that you use. So what you tend to use is the PC version. And actually, if you use office.com and this thing, you discover that almost anything you do, there's an advert for You can't really do that here. Try it in your PC version. So, so I think often the use of Office 365 is a, is a data store, um, which you shove documents into, which are in a non-standard but popular format, we understand, um, to some degree. Um, and, uh, and then a PC version of, of an office suite. Um, as Larry Ellison said, you know, if cloud is the new, you know, if orange is the new black and cloud is the new whatever, then we'll make cloud press releases and branding. But I don't know. How, how tied are you to the actual cloud web service piece, or is it really still documents? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so be scared, but perhaps not incredibly scared. And, and consider using NextCloud, OwnCloud, PyDO, Cfile, any of our, our, you know, the open source alternatives. Um, that, that can now actually, in many cases, do better. Um, actually, Office 365 is subscription service. Right. Okay. And as, as you stop paying for it, you basically have to remove your software from your PC. Sure. And it's a standard way to get Office running, but it's basically, you are not tied forever. You will eventually will decide it's not worth to pay that. And actually, actually very costly. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that might point out. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of truth in that. Yep. Anyone else? How we, oh, gentleman at the front here. I will. Uh, okay. um, it's a big project. How do you um, balance um, new, con new contributions versus the code quality to keep it maintainable? I mean, it's a balance that any project leader has to make. What do you, what do? You do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So just to be sure, just to be clear, I don't lead the project. I, I, I merely participate to, to, to a degree. There are, there are, we have a sort of collective leadership uh, a thing. There's an engineering steering committee, blah, blah, blah. So first, first perhaps, slight uh, improvement on that. But, but um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's a difficult balance. We are not blessed with a vast number of competent new people who want to contribute. So you will be welcomed. <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't worry about that. But in terms of um, trying to steer people away from obviously dangerous things with very little benefit, Occasionally, we do have people that seem to insist on wanting to do just cosmetic, cosmetic changes of, of almost no benefit. And that, that can be uh, distressing. But the, the good news is that if people don't want to review it, it just piles up in their review queue. Yeah, yeah. For your project, how do you handle that? Yeah, so I mean, it's a resourcing issue, isn't it? How much time can you spend to try and bring new people on and get them into the code? We like to think we're a bit of a tar baby. You know, people get. You know, they, they can't escape after a while, you know, so even though they say they do, they, they, they stick to it. And, uh, and there's so much low-hanging fruit. It's easy to, you know, read 10 files and find lots of things to do. So, yeah, do, do, do have a go. I think that's my time. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Michael Weeks.